talking about bone and joint infections today. Uh, welcome to another lecture. Hope uh, you guys are enjoying the channel and the videos. So the idea here is to know when you're in the emergency department and someone presents with an infection, you know when to suspect osteomyelitis, which is an infection of the bone. You know how to evaluate someone with the single joint infection or monoarticular arthritis and you know how to treat an osteomyelitis or septic arthritis and perform joint aspirations. Now these are some of the basic that you're required to do as an emergency physician, as an emergency doctor and also to be able to identify early any joint infection is of paramount importance because that could mean the world to the patient. So this lecture is confined to the evaluation and management in the emergency department setting as most of our videos so far have been and we're generally discussing the adults because children is um, altogether a different category and will be discussed in another video. So osteomyelitis is any inflammation in the bone which is due to an infection and arthritis we know is an inflammation of a joint which can be of a single joint multiple joint or uh, around the joint and septic joint or septic arthritis is when there is an infection in the joint okay so infection in the bone is osteomyelitis infection in the joint is septic arthritis okay so how do you get osteomyelitis um the three main ways you can get osteomyelitis okay so first is the contiguous focus which is the most common type and it's usually a due to trauma surgery or insertion of the hardware now um, this is basically a localized infection that you know is induced by some of the factors and causes a localized infection now, the second most common is vascular insufficiency and it's related to a disease like a diabetes or a peripheral vascular disease and almost always begins with a soft tissue infection that spreads to the bone and the third mode is hematological spread which is actually the least common mode in adults and it's seeded from another source so for example iv drug users or sickle cell disease and it's seen mostly in pre-adolescent children and elderly okay so contiguous focus vascular insufficiency and hematological spread are the three main ways osteomyelitis can happen now acute versus chronic is probably not an important distinction in the emergency department setting except to know that a chronic infection that appears heal can relapse so acute is an infection of the bone which develops over days to weeks whereas chronic is what develops over months to years and it involves the relapses now evaluation first step is always to be able to generate the differentiate so presentation the symptoms can be varied open wound with an exposed bone and draining sinus is a clear-cut indication that this patient has a chronic osteomyelitis and this is a tract it's usually associated with a local swelling with bone pain tenderness now some of the criteria that to consider are vertebral osteomyelitis um, especially in iv drug users or those with indwelling vascular catheters with subacute back pain then salmonella related osteomyelitis in a patient with a history of sickle cell anemia and especially patients with hip pains then prosthetic joint related infections hiasis within the first two years but they still persist at low levels for the life of the prosthesis pseudomonas related can also happen especially in ankle and foot injuries so example a punch of wound to the heel which can cause an osteomyelitis of the calcaneum sternal osteomyelitis can happen after a sternotomy or after a cardiac surgery and then diabetic foot also related infections when uh, the patient's got a history of diabetes microorganisms are multiple 
staff aureus is the most common but depending upon what sort of osteomyelitis what is the setting in it can be polymicrobial different organisms can be related to osteomyelitis obviously uh, any infection start with the blood test complete blood count esr crp are very very important esr uh, was a traditional marker which is more indicative of a long-term infection or inflammation where a crp will give you the day-to-day -day trends and response to treatment x-rays ultrasound ct are the imaging to be done and if you're suspecting a hematogenous source you should consider a bone scan or if you're considering a tumor as your differential now plain x-rays will show you something like this so cortical erosions radiolucencies and destruction along with the periosteal reaction you could also see soft tissue gas or swelling and narrowing of the joint spaces however in an episode of acute osteomyelitis it may take one to two weeks or maybe even longer to be able to see the the changes on an x-ray so clinical suspicion is very, very important a good history is very very important a thorough physical examination is the keystone Sensitivity of uh, X-ray films is varied from about 28% to 93%. Specificity is similarly from 33 to 92%. MRI is a superior study, uh, sensitivity reaching up to 100%. CT is not good as MRI, um, and also MRI can detect osteomyelitis much earlier than a CT scan. However, it can be used to evaluate the extent of bony involvement and can be used to follow response to therapy. Now, bone scan takes time to perform and obviously not an emergency department test, but it's a radio tracer which can definitely localize the area of infection. Ultrasound is useful, if, especially if you are trying to aspirate smaller joints and looking for effusions in the joints. Okay, so diabetic foot osteomyelitis, the no studies addressed, um, really have addressed that uh, uh, history that's helpful in diagnosing uh, diabetic foot osteomyelitis. You are basically base, uh, basing your diagnosis upon the history of diabetes and presence of ulcers which look infected. So lab tests will show you infection, high raised ESR and swab cultures are useless unless uh, you know you you can um, you, you're thinking of something else and you want to isolate the organism x-rays and mri may have a very sensitivity and specificity as we've already discussed antibiotics in the emergency department uh, are the main modality of choice but they're often paired with uh, eventual surgical source control now there's no clear guidelines because there's no clear evidence to these and open fracture prophylaxis is very very important choice of antibiotics always depends upon the likely pathogen and clinical scenario. In 2011, um, guidelines were introduced depending upon the organism. So you can pause the video here, just have a look. Now these have been frequently updated, so you should have a look at the frequently updated guidelines. Okay, joint infections are very, very important. Trauma is the most likely cause of an acute septic joint in the emergency department setting uh, but the most important thing to understand here is that we should be able to distinguish between a non-infected and an infected joint okay so a septic arthritis and other acute arthritis so all of these will present with redness pain swelling so redness a uh, person who presents to you with a joint swelling pain and redness does not necessarily have an infection in there so uh, also important to know here is that if you try to aspirate every joint which comes with swelling and pain and effusion then you might end up inducing infection into the joint and making a non-infected joint a septic joint so you gotta be very careful uh, when you're dealing with the query infected joints and uh, a detailed history examination is very, very important. So as you can see, um, the table on the right shows differential diagnosis of joint pain uh, 
according to you know classification so monopoly or periarticular and you can see you know that it can be varied varieties it could be osteoarthritis gout rheumatoid arthritis it could be any sort of arthritis which could present with similar features so poly Articular infectious arthritis uh, is also not so uncommon, especially in some of the developed countries. Example, uh, with the Lyme's disease, which can present with uh, infectious arthritis. Uh, for Lyme disease per se, it's transmitted by tick bite, uh, pathognomonic rash is an erythema migrans. Uh, it can develop arthritis about fifty percent of patients. Patients are usually afebrile with asymmetric arthritis, and we usually treat them with the extended course of oral antibiotics and admit the patients if they have any neurologic or cardiac manifestations. Now, fifty percent of the septic arthritis is seen in large joints, especially the knee uh, and the hips, but can also be in the wrist and the ankles. IV drug user seems to have predilection for the axial joints like sternoclavicular or sternomandibular joints. Two different kinds of septic arthritis include non-gonococcal and gonococcal. And gonococcal is usually because of the bacterium spread or sexually transmitted infections. Um, how do we get septic arthritis? Hem hematological spread for septic arthritis is the most common and is related to bacteremia of any cause. Uh, could be underlying joint disease like rheumatoid or some other source. Direct inoculation is less common when you are specifically talking about a joint infection. Uh, examples include surgery or pre-existing osteomyelitis or skin infections. Now, if you look at the history and physical examination, there have not been multiple studies which have looked at sensitivity and specificity of uh, evaluation of a joint infection. Um, tests include the standard blood tests, okay, so blood counts, blood cultures, inflammatory markers, x-rays and joint fluid analysis. Now joint fluid analysis is the gold standard these days if you're just thinking of a joint infection, aspirating a joint, sending it to the lab looking for um, infection in there is the gold standard okay so if you look at this chart here you know first have a look at the risk factors so age more than 80 diabetes rheumatoid arthritis recent joint surgery hyponee prosthesis skin infections all these are considered as risk factors of a joint infection physical examination main important feature is fever okay so if the patient comes and tells you that he's got fever with chills and rigors for the last few days and comes with a swollen knee and he tells you that hey my knee has never been this sore or I've never had these issues before then should uh, strongly think of uh, uh, you know uh, joint infection now if you look at uh, the serum values, CRP is very, very important. And the likelihood ratio uh, is 1.6 if the CRP is high. Um, likelihood ratio for CRP 1.6 is, you know, considered very, very high. So on the positive side, e, um, similarly for peripheral blood count and uh, ESR, uh, in, you know, are very highly suggestive of uh, uh, joint infection. Now, white blood cells, uh, what, what should be the count and what should be the polymorphonuclear count? So if you look at these values, um, white blood counts more than 100,000 are about 99% specific and uh, to for the patient to have a joint infection whereas those uh, less than 25,000 are li unlikely to have a joint infection. So in the clinical setting, it's usually if the white cells are more than 50,000, you consider it to be an infection and the patient needs a washout. Similarly, for the polymorphonucleosides, if they're more than 90%, it's a very high chance that the patient is infected. So that's all you have to remember from this chart. Polymorphonuclear cells more than 90%, with a joint fluid aspirate showing a white cell count of more than 50,000 is highly suggestive of infection.
Uh, other findings could include a low glucose, high protein and high LDH, but the bottom line is that history and physical exam are not able to substantially change the probability of the disease with an acute painful and swollen joint and that's what we've been talking about. All these arthritis can present in the similar way with a similar history and the similar examination findings. The only extra feature in a septic arthritis will be fever, um, but the main clinching diagnosis is a joint fluid aspirate and you should always look for crystals as well when you take an aspirate, send it to the lab. The important things are you look for bacteria, you look for crystals, you look for white blood cell count, and you look for percentage of polymorphonucleosides. Okay, so as I said, you know, these are things you should always look for. You can also do protein and glucose, but they are not, um, you know, really diagnostic. Now, is there a way to determine if the patient has gout as a cause of their acute monoarticular arthritis? Uh, there's a study in Dutch family practice office setting uh, where they looked at signs and symptoms of acute arthritis irrespective of the previous similar episodes. They collected detailed information on history, physical examination, medications, etc. And the patients underwent a joint aspiration within 24 hours and they created a scoring system to predict the possibility of gout. So seven variables to score and 13 total points. And the authors suggested if there's less than or equal to four, that rules out gout. And if there's more than or equal to eight, it's highly likelihood of gout. So male sex, Previously, patient reported arthritis attack, onset within one day, joint redness, metatarsal phalangeal joint involvement, hypertension or more than one cardiovascular disease, serum uric acid levels more than 5.88. So in, in the emergency department, um, looking at the bootstraps method as described here, if uh, the score is equal to more than eight, uh, it probably rules in gout and can treat empirically without uh, needle joint aspiration. As we've discussed before, doing an unnecessary joint aspiration could actually cause a septic arthritis in an otherwise a non-septic joint. So you've got to be very careful. So all these patients need a joint washout and irrigation in the operating theater and antibiotics. So the common organisms we've already discussed, Staph, Streptococcus are some of the common organisms, Vancomycin, Keftriaxone, depending upon what the bacterial sensitivities. Um, that's how you treat gonococcal, treated with Keftriaxone. Okay, so what joints should we aspirate in the emergency department? What should be the needle size? Should you go through the area of cellulitis or not? Do you inject steroids or just aspirate? What are the risks? Um, how much fluid you take off? And what do you do if you get a try, get a dry tap shed? Shall you use ultrasound guided or different approach? So some of the common joints that we try to do an aspirate, one of the most common is the knee. Other ones are elbow and ankle okay hip joints are preferably not aspirated in the uh, in the emergency setting uh, wrist can also be uh, aspirated in the emergency setting okay but knee is probably the most common joint that we see uh, infection now you could go medial or lateral approach lateral approach is preferred uh, where you stabilize the patella and just go through a supralateral margin of the patella with the needle pointing distally and towards the medially okay so that's for the knee and uh, then elbow is um, you, you know as very nicely depicted in this diagram uh, the landmarks are the radial head lateral epicondyle and the tip of the olecranon uh, a needle is inserted into the center of the triangle which penetrates only the enconeous muscle and capsule before entering the joint uh, the patient is supine with the elbow flexed to 90 degrees and the hand is stuck under the buttock a triangle is made with these points, the lateral apicondyle, radial head and the olecranon process. 
The needle is inserted in the center of the triangle perpendicular to the skin and parallel to the radial head and inserted about three by four to one inch deep. So this is how you aspirate a um, elbow joint. Now, is it safe to do arthrocentesis and someone taking warfarin? Uh, now it all depends upon the INR and what treatment uh, uh, apart from warfarin is the patient on. Is he taking any other anticoagulants or not? And if the INR is fine and if you think the suspicion is high, then yes, you can. Um, okay, so final thoughts. Osteomyelitis, we should look at the goals in evaluation. Um, so decide if someone has a clinical concern for osteomyelitis. Understand the testing options. Treat based on their likely pathogens. And disposition without definitive diagnosis should not be done. For septic arthritis, decide if someone has clinical concern for septic arthritis. Understand the testing options. And you should know how to completely perform a joint aspiration or an arthrocentesis. Well, thanks for staying with us and watching the video. Keep coming back for more. Do subscribe to the channel and click on the bell notification icon. Um, please do leave your questions and comments below.